Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Flint Community Webinar, your community resource every Friday at noon. I'm Jennifer Edwards Johnson. So happy to be back here with you again this week. We've got a lot of amazing partners here to help us out today and bring us trusted, credible messaging. We've got Dr. Brittany Taylor with us, who's going to talk to us a little bit about vaping with her colleague, um, Lisa Faulkner. We've got Dr. G and Nurse T here to talk to us about what they're seeing out in the community. And we've got uh, Allie Lopez and Sydney Bradford from the health department to talk to us a little bit about their tobacco compliance program. So lots to talk about, super excited. Um, I think we're even gonna have Carrie Champion talk to us a little, about, a little bit today. So uh, let's see, I think we're gonna start today's conversation talking about vaping and what what is vaping, what we need to know, the misconceptions and myths. And so I think we're gonna have Dr. Brittany come start that discussion. All right, hi everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Brittany Taylor. And if you give me one second, I will <laughs> share no my presentation with you. Um, so give me one second because I am not as great at doing the Zoom. <laughs> um, all right. We can see your slides. You can see my slides, but yep. nothing too exciting. Okay. Well, but yours right. pretty exciting, I think. Though. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so my name's uh, Dr. Brittany Taylor again. Um, I am an internist and a pediatrician, which is a fancy way of saying that I take care of both adults and children. I am originally from Northern New York and I moved here a couple months ago, actually in August, so it's more than a couple now, um, to work at uh, Michigan State University um, at the Pediatric Public Health Initiative. Um, and I have a specific interest in electronic cigarettes um, and teaching people more about it and how helping prevent uh, youth use of this. So this presentation that I have is a um, shortened one from one that I gave that was over an hour and a half. So there's a lot of different things that I'm going to be trying to cover in the next kind of 20 minutes. So there's definitely things that I'm going to kind of go over, uh, kind of breeze over. So if there's specific questions, please, please, please do not hesitate to reach out and ask. Um, I am happy to talk more. So some of the things that I wanted to talk about, um, so what you need to know. Um, so a big thing that I like to talk about is all the different kinds of, and, uh, of vapes or electronic cigarette devices. Um, I'm going to use probably the term vaping more often, though I'll probably use it interchangeably with electronic cigarette devices. The FDA calls them an ENDS device, um, which is just a shorthand for electronic nicotine delivery system. Um, every different place has a different terminology for it. So a lot of times you really have to dig into it. Um, so one of the first things that I talk about usually is that there's four different generations of um, electronic cigarettes. Um, the first generation really looked like a true cigarette. You can see that all the way on the left over here. Um, and then our second generation was a pre-filled cartridge, um, which is a little bit um, you might see that um, being modified or used, but it was kind of more of our original, um, more one that you would think of now. Third generation is a tank or a mod, which is more uh, more common now, I would say, especially in younger adults. Um, and the reason it's called a mod is because it can be modified. So you can use um, different substances in it, such as cannabis, et cetera, and you can mix your own. So it's very much more popular. Um, the Dr. Taylor, your presentation, I just want to, your, it, it's, it's coming up until I can see your notes. Oh, but, okay. Just so like, but I just don't want. To, <laughs> I just don't want it to obscure the slides for people. So I'm sorry to. You're good. There, better. I can do it without the notes, so it's no big deal. <laughs> now you can see all the stuff I was going to say. And then <laughs> the fourth generation is the one that we really typically think of. So those like the jewel pod and the puff bar and those things. And those are the ones that are, are pre-filled, and um, some of them are refillable, but most of them are supposed to be a single um, use device. So those are the big four kinds. The most common is going to be, again, the mods, so the third generation, and the fourth generation are the pods mods. Um, some of the other terms that we talk about when we're talking about electronic cigarette use is dabbing and dipping. Um, and this is when you actually modify the device so you can aerosolize a more potent amount of it. Um, sometimes they call it dripping or hacking. So it's when they modify the device or break the device so you can actually specifically put on um, a substance. I'm hoping this will play. It might not. Um, where you actually put um, some of the um, 
liquid on to a heated source and then breathe that in so you can actually kind of get more of it um, inhaled. Um, there's also a things called cloud chasing, which is when you're doing tricks and things like that. Blowing O's is another term for some of that stuff. And there's actually been vaping competitions um, and um, different trips, uh, tricks and um, things that you'll see, especially on social media about this. So some of the other terms that we talk about there. So what actually is an e-cigarette liquid? So the big breakthrough that made um, e-cigarettes become so popular was something called nicotine salts. So it's actually when they took the nicotine out of tobacco. So tobacco um, typically has nicotine in it and um, it's our primary ingredient in cigarettes. Um, so they took out um, the nicotine and they made it into a, um, what we call nicotine salts. And this allowed for e electronic cigarettes to deliver a high volume, uh, a high payload basically of nicotine without any harsh uh, effects of, um, of the typical tobacco. So you could get um, a lot of nicotine and just a little bit of um, material. Um, so that's what makes it very enjoyable to experience. Um, they initially had some issues when they were trying typical nicotine um, derivatives because they would have to get so high that they would burn the individuals using it or it would be very harsh. So nicotine is also really a breakthrough that allowed electronic cigarettes to be as successful as they are. Propylene glyc uh, glycol and glycerin are an additive that helps to stabilize the nicotine salts as well as some of the other flavoring components. There's been a lot in the media about this, about if it's potentially helpful or <laughs> hurtful, uh, or it's gonna be harmful. Um, we typically use it to, in like different um, beauty products and things like that to keep them stabilized. Um, so they're okay, technically for um, human use, but not consumption. Um, so depending on how you use them, it may not be the best way. And then of course, flavorings. And there's a, to date over 15,000 flavors um, currently. So there's a whole lot of different things and not all of them are very well regulated. So other things that you can see in e electronic cigarettes, um, and these can be components of either the flavorings or a different part of the flavorings. So CBD and um, THC are very common um, to be used, um, particularly with modifiable devices. Um, diacetyl is um, something that was associated with popcorn lung. Um, it gives a buttery flavor. So uh, it's also been used in um, to make uh, like butterscotch and different things like that, but was associated with not uh, with uh, a really severe lung disease. Um, there's a lot of heavy metals that are often used um, in the making of the battery and the different devices. And this can be um, broken down when the device is actually heated up and so you can inhale that. Menthol is a very common cigarette uh, uh, cigarette flavor and also can be used in flavorings. Aldehydes so different plastics can be burned actually in the e-cigarette device and then inhaled because of that. Um, and the most probably famous of all the devices is, uh, of all the things is vitamin E. So that was the one that was associated with Avali. Um, and that was the e-cigarette um, e-cigarette induced lung injury that was so um, prevalent and concerning a couple years ago. And that was really thought to be the main um, uh, main ingredient that caused these, uh, the, the volley. Oh, Dr. Taylor, someone said that it just started to freeze again. Yep. It, it went back to being 101. Really? Okay. All right. But you were, yeah. Can you see it then? Sorry. I, ahead. nope. It's on vaping 101 for me too. Oh, okay. Maxwell, thank you for that heads up. Thank okay. you. Sorry. Yeah. Oh no. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Oh um, no. Apologies. This is very cool. Thanks. Okay. Can you now see it? Um, I see flavors. Yes. I'm, I'm looking and it's okay. You give me I wonder one. if it's not playing because you're numb. Okay. Okay. Maybe stop and reshare. Yep. Sorry, everybody. No, this is such an in important information. It's stuff that like I had no context for, which I feel like I shouldn't say because I'm lots of people's doctors and they're like, wait. Okay. <laughs> All right, there we go. Oh, so much yeah. better. Yeah, <laughs> <Okay>. thank you. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, so two of the big 
uh, most common and well studied flavors is cinnamaldehyde, which makes a cinnamon flavor. It actually decreases your respiratory immune function and can cause um, much more um, infections, the flu, other viral infections, etc. Banana and chocolate um, flavors typically have a lot of benzene rings and these can increase the inflammation. So if you have any underlying disease such as COPD or asthma, it can actually worsen those. Um, those are the ones that are more specifically been studied, even though studies are still ongoing about a lot of the different flavoring components. Um, so there's a lot of negative health effects of um, e-cigarette usage. I know a lot of people are kind of toting that this may be healthier than um, cigarettes, but it may just be trading one disease out for another. Um, e-cigarettes have been associated with um, different kinds of cancer, including breast, lung, and um, leukemia. Um, also heart attacks, um, increased heart disease. Um, this is a picture of the aorta um, and has been shown to cause more stiffening and um, potentially rupture in the aorta. It can also cause um, increased uh, acid reflux um, as well as more heartburn. Uh, it has been linked to kidney disease. It is um, not recommended in pregnancy and it's actually been uh, associated with increased um, uh, preterm delivery and more birth complications. Um, it affects uh, specifically how the placenta attaches and remains attached. So that way the blood flow to the baby can be compromised. It's been associated with eye disease, particularly glaucoma. Um, it also has been linked to obesity, um, poor blood, blood glucose control or blood sugar control for those who have diabetes. <laughs> obviously lung disease, tons and tons of lung disease, and being more likely to experience the negative effects of um, colds and viral infections, probably related to the inflammation, um, as well as the decreased respiratory function. And this is kind of even more things that have been specifically related to the flavorings. So not only as e-cigarettes in general, even if they are unflavored or traditionally tobacco flavored, um, have been associated with a lot of different um, medical conditions, but also the flavoring specifically um, have been associated with many of the same um, kind of effects. So just to totally belabor the point that they are definitely not um, safe um, just because they may be slightly safer or ha um, than cigarettes does not mean that they are safe. Um, we may be trading out one issue for another. And sometimes it's very difficult to compare the two of them. It's kind of like apples and oranges because it's a whole different um, way to consume nicotine, um, particularly with how hot um, the devices get. Um, they're able to break down um, the typically inhaled substances to a greater degree, which we don't know how that really affects um, the lungs and the body in general. Um, and we'll probably see that in 20, 30 years from now. But at this point, a lot of the early studies have really been showing that this does increase a lot of the diseases that we typically associate with uh, typical combustible cigarette use. So you're like, okay, you just ranted for the last 10 minutes about how bad they are for you. So what, what regulations are in place? So Federally, um, Tobacco 21 um, is in place as well as in Michigan. So this um, bans the sale and the consumption of e-cigarettes and also any tobacco product um, for those under 21. Um, the FDA is currently um, going still through their pre-market tobacco applications. They've, there's so many different applications. Each pro, um, company had to give a different um, application for every single um, product that they do. No flavors except for tobacco have subsequently been approved. So only unflavored or tobacco flavored um, and none have been approved since June, 2022. Um, so there's been a lot of um, like Juul for instance does not have any pro um, um, products that have been um, approved by the FDA. Um, however, they're still on the market because there's a lot of legal battles that go on in the background to actually enforce these regulations. In Michigan, there is no state tax on any e-cigarette device, and there's no special per permit required in order to sell them. Um, the sale, possession, and use is illegal for 21-year-olds, just uh, um, which is the same as the federal law. Uh, and there's laws prohibiting some of the displays, such as a self-service display, if it's at eye level of children, etc. Um, so kind of the next part that I wanted to talk about was who is vaping? Um, why are they vaping? And how can I help? 
So the trends in e-cigarette usage, and this is um, mainly from the CDC data, so it's not specific necessarily to Michigan, just because the, uh, the COVID pandemic messed up kids going to school and taking the, a lot of the surveys, um, shows that there was a huge spike, and this is when we were really concerned in 2018 and 2019, and subsequently fell during that period, um, the period following this. Whether or not this was due to the fact um, that um, kids were at home, so they couldn't you know, do it or they were around their parents or their um, relatives a lot. Um, so they weren't able to vape um, or if they actually had concerns about it, it's unsure. But what we've noticed is that actually the trend, it started to increase again now that we're back in 2022 and kids are back in school. So again, concerning, do I think that it's probably gonna go back up again? Yes, um, just because if we could see this trend that there was a concern again in 2015 and went down and then it spiked again. So why are they vaping? Um, so this is kind of a composite of a lot of different studies that we were talking about, but a big uh, proponent of it was if somebody else was vaping, such as friends or family, um, that they were curious, uh, that they wanted stress relief, um, that they uh, perceived it as being less harmful. A lot of them actually didn't know that there was nicotine in it. They thought they were just vaping a flavor. Um, so they really didn't think that they were having a lot of issues, that they've seen things on social media um, or other celebrities or influencers, um, that they were bored. And then some people obviously vape for the flavors. So. So some of the associations for people who may be at greater risk of vaping, um, it's kind of all over the board. Depending on where you look, what group you see, it can be a lot of different trends. For instance, the American Academy of Pediatrics just put out a study again today that showed that people who are um, who participate in sports are more likely to do that. Um, while some other studies show that um, those who are older are more likely, those who are socially um, outcast or not as involved in their community or close with their families, um, those who have depression or eating disorders. Um, and there's a lot of different things that kind of trigger or motivate people to vape. Um, some people, again, have this perception that e-cigarettes are less harmful. Um, and this is very, very common. Um, there's kind of two, uh, I'm gonna skip this. Um, there's two main groups of people kind of getting into that, that they found more consistently are using e-cigarette. And so this is typically non-Hispanic white males who vape due to friends, family, and social media influence. So those who are like using, uh, doing sports and things like that, um, kind of are, I, I hate to be a stereotype, but a, the male jock um, is one of the big groups. And they often um, are the ones who don't believe in the negative um, health effects of vaping and do it because their friends and, um, and family are doing it. And they often are uh, very not, not believing of a lot of the concern, health concerns about this. The other group is those who are in any basically sort of minority and they're using it for relaxation and stress. And they also believe that it's less harmful than a lot of the other things that they may be doing. So when, thinking about how to address those who are vaping, it's really important to figure out which of the two groups that you might be falling into um, when you're talking to someone because they're completely different motivations and they're coming from completely different places. And it's really important to kind of address that when you're going about trying to do um, any sort of cessation or prevention. So some of the things that we can do um, is uh, to help kind of slow this uh, down and help those who may already be vaping is treating it as an addiction. Um, realizing that nicotine is a highly addictive substance and a lot of the e-cigarettes um, uh, devices give almost as much as a pack of cigarette, if not more, depending on the device. Um, and that nicotine addiction is real and it affects the adolescent brain very differently. Um, another thing that we can do is push for e-cigarette um, regulating the sales. Um, right now, again, it's not very well regulated in Michigan well, and across the United States, but particularly in Michigan. Banning of flavors, it's a big motivation for a lot of kids to start using. And they often, when they are flavored, don't believe that there's actually nicotine in it or they aren't aware of that. Um, incorporating more education so we can combat that idea that no, there is nicotine in this and talking about how addictive this is. Um, and then supporting research to show this, um, particularly the long-term outcomes of that. And a big thing um, that I'm really hoping to push forward in Genesee County is implementing suspension to a uh, suspension alternatives, because it's found that if you suspend a student, they're likely to go back and still continue to vape. 
So um, there's a lot of different resources. I'm going to push through this because I've prattled on a lot. <laughs> um, there's tons and tons of different um, resources that you can use to help quit. Um, a lot of big things are online sales now. Um, they're not really well regulated at a space at all. Um, this kind of shows about how what uh, flavors are most prevalent um, in the use for adolescents, usually fruit, menthol, um, and not as much tobacco. Um, so kids who see someone else vape are much more likely to vape. Um, there's a lot of different educational serve uh, like different resources for schools that are hoping to implement um, an alternative to suspension or different um, prevention interventions. And I'm happy to talk more about this. I know about all of these different ones, so I can send out these slides after if you have questions about that. The ones with the gold star are actually been um, evidence-based and have been practiced um, in various different schools throughout the United States. Um, a lot of social media about this. Um, mostly it's pro-vaping. So I'm gonna click through because I've talked too long. <laughs> You haven't talked too long. This was really, really helpful and thoughtful. Um, I had a question that that has come up in the community, like vaping, hookah, like smoking. Like you, I appreciate one of the things you said, which is that people have different motivations. And as someone wearing my primary care hat, the motivation feels really important because that's how we engage with people around how they're going to think about quitting and and what's important to them and how we think about healthy strategies and on a risk ratio right if i'm talking to an adolescent in my office and they're like okay well there's vaping which you're saying is worse than cigarette smoking but what about this hookah stuff or marijuana like what would you be saying or what should we be thinking to advise people who are trying to make those sort of risk benefit thoughts? So there's a lot of other things that you can do besides smoke any product. There's <laughs> so many different things that you could do um, besides smoking that. Um, so most of the time I'm like, really, why do we have to smoke something? Um, yeah. But um, hookah is definitely more dangerous um, than probably cigarette smoking, even um, just because there is absolutely no filter that usually comes with hookah and the products are really not well regulated, um, even put even more so than 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 uh, electronic cigarettes. Um, and often you will consume them for a, a large amount in a short amount of time. You often share the hookah with a lot of other people. So there's all this, especially with uh, the flu and colds going around, there's all sorts of different things. Um, and then cannabis um, and marijuana, <sighs> I think the, the jury's still out on a lot of adolescent usage for that. Um, it definitely affects the brain uh, later on in life. Um, so affects memory, um, attention, et cetera. So it can definitely be um, a long-term effect that we haven't quite seen right now. So I usually definitely steer them clear of marijuana. Um, and again, try and talk about what other things would we, can we do besides smoke? I mean, I know that other people are doing it, but that doesn't mean that you should do that as well. So yeah, that's fantastic. And I, I see Lisa Fockler. I want to make sure we get her engaged in the conversation. And I see Carrie Chanter has a has a question. I wonder if we can spotlight Lisa, make her a part of our experts in the conversation, and, and then maybe we can get the question from Carrie. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And uh, just want to like reinforce the things that Dr. Brittany has said. And if you felt that she was rushed and didn't get enough you didn't get enough information. We are already partnered with her to deliver her full program and presentation in March. Um, that will be presented on March 16th at the Countywide Behavioral Health Collaborative. And I'll put a flyer in the chat so you can see when that's coming up and register for that. Because we are so thankful to have uh, Dr. Brittany here in our community to really provide that expert um, voice uh, to addressing these issues among youth, because as she said, there's so much misinformation and miscommunication out there. And uh, we really have to step up and provide a counter message uh, to all of this. And so 
Um, some of the things that the Genesee County Prevention Coalition has to offer, because we are getting um, many requests from schools and from parents wanting and needing resources to address vaping, uh, whether it's uh, vaping of nicotine substances or THC substances. So um, what we have to offer currently is a online uh, program called Third Millennium Classroom. And I'll put information in the chat about the description of those courses and how to access them. Um, we are promoting them to our school partners as a way to offset or reduce suspensions because as Dr. Brittany said, you know, consequences are only one motivating factor for change. And as you mentioned, we want to tap into what is motivating either change or motivating the use of these products, right? And I think one of the underlying things that we all need to focus on is what is motivating the, the need for using the substance. And ultimately that's gonna come back to addressing some unmet social emotional, emotional need. And they're using the substance as a way to cope um, or to you know, um, satisfy that that those feelings of discomfort or or stress or or coping with trauma and all of those things that are really the root causes that we want to be able to address once a young person is you know at that point of either readiness or willingness <laughs> based on internal motivation or external <laughs> to to look at that underlying motivation of why they're using uh, the devices and why they're turning to those substances so that we can, as Dr. Brittany said, um, assist them in finding better, healthier means for coping um, uh, with these issues and developing those skills to address the challenges that they're facing as a young person uh, today. So, so those are that's one of the resources I just <clears throat> excuse me wanted to highlight because we are just recently launching that um, to our school partners. But again, it's open to anyone uh, with a young person that would be seen beneficial in in receiving that. Um, the other resource that we all often promote um, in terms of cessation or assisting with quitting would be the My Life My Quit. Uh, Michigan uh, Department of Health and Human Services resources. So I can drop the link into the chat for that as well. Um, so we're just really trying to fill the need, fill the gap um, and supporting other types of programming and services with our other prevention providers across the network here in Genesee County. Lisa, I'm so sorry I didn't introduce you. So Lisa is the executive director at the Genesee County uh, Prevention Coalition. So super thankful for your expertise and support and giving those resources. Most welcome. I wondered if there's ever, if you ever recommend a conversation around cost, is there a significant cost differential between e-cigarettes and cigarettes in a way to, have you ever used that as sort of a motivator to say like, why spend your money on this one? <laughs> I mean, it's a huge, um, it's a huge motivator, particularly for adolescents who are very cost, uh, cost sensitive. Um, we'll say so. That's why uh, the cigarette tax works so well because it kind yeah. of keeps it out of the prices, uh, the price range of adolescents um, and young adults who are using. Um, right now in Michigan, it because there is no tax on e-cigarettes, it often may be a little bit more financially available for yeah. young adults and adolescents. So we're hoping that um, that this will be changing hopefully in the next couple of years so that way we can make it uh, less uh, available and maybe a little bit more financially difficult for them to obtain. So, yeah. That makes total sense. I want to make sure we bring Carrie forward because I know she, uh, she, I saw your hand up, so I don't want to miss. And I'm sorry because I jumped right over your question. So, <laughs> oh, it's no big deal. And I, it'll probably be really quick and it would, perhaps there's no answer, but I know that we focus a lot. Like, I, I, um, Dr. Brittany, there was that slide about cessation support, and I am very excited to see what those resources are. Just wondering, does if it is um, a nicotine delivery system and not THC, is NRT ever considered from a primary care for, for adolescents? Like, do you ever consider NRT? Because I feel like sometimes we just say, oh gosh, you guys should quit, but really they're addicted. And so it's like, <laughs> do we do NRT with these kids that young? Do you have an opinion about that? And yeah. first I want 
Brittany to explain what NRT is. Oh, yes, I was sorry. going to say. Um, so <laughs> NRT is nicotine replacement um, treatment. Um, so that's where you get a nicotine patch or gum um, or a couple different um, different ways to to use it. So because I use uh, because I use adults because I treat adults, I'm very familiar with nicotine replacement treatment. I actually have a whole uh, lecture about it that I give to the residents here about it. So it's definitely something that's been used in um, adolescents for cigarette cessation because again e-cigarettes are such a new thing it's definitely um something that's been tried and found to be effective particularly the gum um so that's been helpful as well as chantex um and buprenorphine has been helpful as well so it's definitely something that i always say to consider um when you have an adolescent that you're concerned is addicted to um vaping there's actually a whole score that you can use to to assess the level of vaping um which is a little bit different um than tobacco and other substances it's so Thank funny you. that it's so funny that you I mean the gum is super effective because that makes sense to me intuitively right that you know a younger person would be more likely to use the gum than say the patch and remembering to do that or, yes. or what have you so really thoughtful really sort of common sense approaches which in my experience has been the ones that are most effective as well before I let you go, there was one really interesting question in the chat, and that was, are the e-cigarette lobbyists as powerful as the tobacco industry lobbyists? And I, you know, I do sort of wonder what is the, the lobbying and marketing look like on, on both sides of that coin? So, so I'm really involved in, um, particularly at the state level, doing um, policy work around this. So I do know that the majority of the e-cigarette companies are owned actually by cigarette companies. Um, so um, Reynolds, um, which is a huge, I can't even remember which cigarette company they own right now, but it's one of the main, I think it's Marlboro. Um, they own, um, they, don't, they think they're buying Puff Bar right now, but they own Sorion, which is one of the top brands. And Jewel is also owned now by pretty much entirely by Altrium, um, who is another huge cigarette um, uh, company. So the majority of them are just as powerful. <laughs> um, and a lot of them are very into talking about this as a cessation tool, which it's never it has yet to be proven um, to actually help with cigarette cessation, which is ironic given that they are cigarette sales. So do you feel like they're they've been they've been targeting more adolescents with their e-cigarettes then and kind of backing off of the regular cigarettes is that kind of the trend we're seeing that's yeah so this was a big uh issue with jewel um they brought it in front of congress um and they were found guilty of not guilty in that way um but they were hold, held accountable for the fact that they were um definitely um advertising towards youth. Um, they were giving them out to in social influencers. They were picturing young, beautiful people running and dancing and they were bright and colorful. Um, so a lot of uh, the advertisements that Jewel initially went on um, was very much very directed towards young um, individuals, not older individuals that we typically think of as longtime smokers who are trying to get cessation. Um, so if you check out um, Stanford, um, their tobacco toolkit, they actually have a whole section about where they compare um, previous cigarette um, sales advertisements from like the uh, 50s and 60s, and they compare them to um, e-cigarette sales um, advertisements. And it is very striking how similar they are. It's actually one of the things that they use um, in educating youth about um, cigarettes and e-cigarettes, just to show that they're doing the same things that they were previously doing to get younger people to um, use tobacco. Yeah, that's so interesting. And it, it it's really interesting in the context of the one slide you showed, where you showed that particularly adolescents from marginalized backgrounds are more likely to sort of use e-cigarettes in the context of stress, right? Which, you know, sort of dovetails with data we see about rising levels of anxiety, rising, rising levels of depression. And it makes like complete sense to me that populations that are marginalized and are experiencing that in multiple would then be looking for resources. When you think of targeted interventions for those populations, what have they typically included? So a lot of times it's 
breaking down the social norms around e-cigarettes. A lot of adolescents believe that everyone is using e-cigarettes. And so it's just part of what we do and things like that. Um, and so it's, it's been found that it's very effective to um, kind of break that social, uh, that idea of the social norm for that. And then also giving them coping techniques. So um, they did a study where they asked um, students what they really wanted to see in the prevention and cessation and learning about different things that they could do to cope with it was one of the top things that they wanted to know about as well as the health effects. Um, so I think I think students want to know about how to study better and handle stresses and just deal with life in general and have kind of tools that they can reach for instead of this and, and independent of using it. Yeah. Um, so I think focusing on that um, when you find someone who might be using or interested in using or at risk of doing that is really important. So yes, basically finding yeah. they're, they're interested, that's what they want. That makes total sense, right? Like, don't yeah. tell me, don't just tell me not to use it. Give me some strategies for how to manage my life if I'm not going to use it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, don't just take away my coping mechanisms. All right. It is 1235. I, I promise you this is the last question because I lied and I said the last question was the last question. But I there's another really great question from the chat and I wanted to, to honor that. Um, it says, we had a myriad of data on bad effects of tobacco, like heart disease or stroke. Are we gathering similar data on on the impact of e-cigarettes or have or what they're having on the health, especially on youth? Or is it too early to tell the long-term impacts? So unfortunately, of course, it's going to take a long time to tell what 30 years of using a, an electronic cigarette device is going to be. That being said, a lot of the markers that we can see um, in in adults and in youth who are using are very similar. So they've been doing a lot of studies where they've been comparing um, the inflammatory markers um, that are seen in the lungs of uh, those who use it cigarettes and those who use e-cigarettes and those who use both compared to someone who doesn't. And in some cases, depending on um, the inflammation that they're looking at, it's actually increased in e-cigarette usage. Um, so it's it's definitely, um, there's a lot of bad markers that long-term use of this is going to be equivalent um, um, to using cigarettes. Um, they have a lot of, they have tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of, of mice models. Of course, mice are not humans, um, but their lifespans are a lot shorter. And um, so the effects of it on heart disease, on lung disease, um, on the teeth, on different things like that have all been proven in mice. Um, so likely we're gonna see that in adults. So, but unfortunately we kind of have to see wait it, it out. Wait, yeah. so. Dr. Taylor, uh, Lisa Fockler, super appreciate your time, your support, your expertise. Thank you so much for talking to us in our community. Um, look forward to having you on again. Hopefully we didn't keep you too long. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think dovetailing this really amazing conversation around vaping and what resources we have for, for our adolescent population who's thinking about that. I want to bring, we've got three really important people. We've got Sydney Bradford and Lee, um, and oh no, where did she go? Yeah. And Ali Lopez, there she is. Um, and Ali Lopez, who are gonna talk a little bit to us about the um, health department's tobacco program. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And then I would love for Carrie Chanter to pop in and in, in the discussion about some of the um, Narcan resources that we've recently heard um, will be coming to the community. So thank you so much to all of you for your expertise that you're bringing today. Allie, you wanna talk about the education portion? Yeah. Um, hello, my name is Allie. I am from the Genesee County Health Department. Um, Sydney and I are fairly new to the Health Department's tobacco program. Um, I started in June of last year and she just started in January of this year. Um, so we're kind of trying to revamp the program. Um, as of right now, we're mainly focused on compliance. Um, Genesee County is only one of three counties in the state of Michigan that requires their retailers to have a county license. So our county license actually gives them the authority to sell tobacco in the county. Um, there's Ingham County and Marquette County also who have these licenses. Um, so January is usually our busiest month of the year um, that has the most retailers that need to renew. Um, and we're also working currently on updating our tobacco retailer list uh, the state of Michigan sends us our tobacco retailer list 
at the beginning of every year and ask us to verify that these places are still selling tobacco and then um, make sure if they're selling vape or not. And then we are currently going around canvassing the county to make sure there's no new tobacco retailers that we were not aware of that opened up and going in and talking to the owners to see if they sell vape. And um, another big piece is vendor education. When we go into the stores, talking to the employees and the owner, letting them know that um, the law did pass, that you have to be 21 to purchase tobacco in Michigan. I know a lot of people were telling us, well, I thought it was 18 um, and only federal law was 21, but we um, just want everyone to know that you have to be 21 in order to purchase tobacco. So we're going over with them how to look at IDs um, and how to turn people away if they're not old enough to purchase tobacco. And to uh, piggyback on her, in, in the spring, as we progress through the compliance portion of it, we will be uh, going out and doing stings in the stores too, because we do realize there are a lot of stores who are still selling um, to minors and who are also breaking the cigarettes up and selling them singles. So we're kind of targeting on that too. And we do know that uh, the state and the federal government or feds are also doing stings too. Um, later on, we will also be incorporating a vape education into our communication with the schools and other venues that we're gonna be participating in to bring education and awareness to um, smoking cessation and vaping. So we're trying to get this together now. We're like we said, we're fairly new, but we're uh, we both started out in the COVID department, so we did that for two years, and so now we're transitioning over into this and trying to get this program back to where it should be. So we appreciate you guys having us. We really thank you for inviting us to this. Can't hear you. I know I, I should be a pro at this. Uh, thank you so much for talking a little bit about that. Can you tell us what resources when we think about tobacco cessation have typically been successful when they've been in the community? Like, I, I it makes total sense to me that making sure that individual retailers have licensing and that that kind of decreases or creates more burden for people to sell, right? Can you talk to us a little bit about what resources have you seen that have been successful usually to stop smoking when when they've been lobbied in the community? And that can be Carrie or Lisa or Sydney. Allie, what can you um, speak on that or Carrie, Lisa? Um, yeah, that is a good question. <laughs> mm -hmm. So just coming from, you know, back in the day when I did the smoking cessation programs with the American Lung Association, um, you know, we, we've made so much progress in uh, smoking uh, cessation and reducing smoking as a whole across the population. And I think that we kind of put our, you know, took our foot off the gas in terms of cessation as a primary strategy. Um, and what we're seeing now is that with vaping, we are really behind in terms of where we need to be to be able to support individuals at any age um, who are now finding themselves addicted to nicotine. Um, and from what I understand, this addiction, you know, is, is much harder and much different than if uh, what we saw in the past from smoking um, addiction or smoking um, traditional uh, tobacco. So it's very difficult to know where a person is at in terms of getting them to a point of, you know, stopping and weaning. Um, you know, because it's hard to, what we used to do when we were doing smoking cessation, we would, you know, look at them as a pack a day smoker and give them strategies for cutting back, you know, and uh, shortening the time frame in which they would, you know, have a cigarette. And those strategies are, are, are not as effective with the vaping because we don't really know how much nicotine they're taking in mm -hmm. in a 24 hour period. So where do we even start with those types of strategies of tapering or you know, 
limiting the amount of time. And so, um, so that it's not a good answer, <laughs> unfortunately. A, but this is, is this the things that we're we have to get up to speed with. No, that's really helpful context. There are two questions that come to mind. And Sydney and Ali, I was hoping maybe you could help us think about like what are the barriers you run into relative to compliance? Like, is it that you know people don't want to comply or that you're getting licenses up to date? What can you tell us a little bit about what you what barriers you run into into the community around compliance? Are you speaking about the vendors or the vendors? either really? I'd be interested to hear both sides of that. Well, the vendors are, they're about making money. So that's their goal is to make money, number one. And so they're, you know, the laws were at 18. Now they're 21. So they're hesitant to stop selling to the 18 years because that was their, one of their bigger audiences. So now we have to show them how to read the license because they're altering the license. There's a lot of things that we have to give them education on because they're just not going to say no if if they know that they're going to make this money from the kids point of view or the younger people i think a lot of it just like with marijuana the smell so vaping does not produce that smell on them that cigarettes do and then as a social worker i'm thinking that if in the family if the parents are vaping then they're giving them the impression that it's it's safer to vape than it is to smoke so i think we have to address the adults, you know, um, give them education, more education and help them so that they can teach their kids that this is just as dangerous as cigarette smoking. But if they're seeing their parents vaping and their friends vaping, they're thinking it's safer. So, you know, I mean, I, and, I, and I get the, the whole aroma kind of thing because if they have the flavor things, they're thinking it's better because it smells good and it tastes good. So um, we got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Go ahead, Allie. Uh, I definitely agree with what Sydney said. As far as like the retailer's standpoint, they're really just concerned about making that money. I know a lot of times um, when we are trying to get them to pay their license on time, um, a lot of them will say like, well, we don't have the money to pay right now, but like you have to pay. This is what's giving you the authority to sell, but also in terms of selling to minors, they're just worried about making the money where we're trying to tell them it's important not to sell to minors because obviously if we catch them we can write them a citation um but there's also like the fda and um other people who also can catch them selling as well and they can lose their um liquor license as well if they're getting caught selling to minors so there's a lot at stake for them they could lose potentially their whole business so it is important to id people and not sell to minors and, I'm a little bit of a novice, so I'm going to ask the question of like, are there a limited number of tobacco licenses? Are they like liquor licenses? And no, Brittany's like, no, no, there's not a limited. There is, there is no tobacco license, retail licensure in the state of Michigan. So except for like for county specific. So yes, got it. There's, yeah, there's no general one so that you can't lose anyone can sell uh, unless you're in the, the specific counties. Anyone can sell tobacco. So there is no repercussions. Um, it, in terms of like losing the ability to spell, sell tobacco products, it's a fine. So it's after okay. three um, citations in the state of Michigan that you um, you possibly can get your business closed. So you guys may, might, may know more about that part um, and what Genesee County specifically is. I know that Genesee County thankfully is much stronger in that regulation. So this is one of the areas of policy that I'm working on at the state level. So we're yeah. <laughs> That is super helpful to know because I, I actually thought you had to have some like specific, you know, compliance to be able to sell. Yeah, but it's, yeah, one of 10 states in the United States that does not have any sort of retail licensure. Yeah. And just to add another layer to the importance of the work that the health department is doing in our community in terms of compliance checks is that um, our federal block grant dollars are tied to mm -hmm. federal leg legislation called the SINAR amendment, which requires okay. states to have a less than 20% um, compliance sell rate, um, or we risk losing our federal block grant dollars or portions of those dollars. And that is one of the primary funding sources for, for 
the prevention uh, programs that are funded here in Genesee County through Region 10. So we support the health department and the work that they're doing. Um, and we really have to enlist all of the community. So if a, you know, a community member sees um, a retailer selling to a minor or breaking up packs of cigarettes, those are things that need to be reported. And, Absolutely. you know, it's not, it's not to, you know, make somebody out to be the bad guy. We're just trying to protect young people, you know, and, and it is vital to our overall, you know, funding for programs, prevention services across Genesee County. Lisa, when you say those things need to be reported, who, like, I see a retailer doing something inappropriate, selling to a minor or something like that. Who would I report it to? Us. <laughs> okay. So I'm I'm calling Sydney you and Allie. Call, you would call Allie or myself, and then okay. we, or, uh, the the um, environmental health department would take the complaint, and then they would either go out and do something, or they would send it over to us, and then we would follow up on it. Uh, but yeah, you it's easy to do that. We've got several complaints in already about yeah. selling to minors, and and there are some stores who are repeat offenders. I mean, they just like we don't care. We're just going to keep doing it. So. We have to start imposing those fines. And like Lisa said, uh, uh, the majority of our funding, I mean, that's a lot of money, a lot of dollars we bring in. So we have to make sure that we keep this, um, you know, keep our, uh, keep the cur license current and make sure that people are following the guidelines and rules because that's a lot of money, it's a lot of money. And I wanna clarify this idea of license because maybe I'm so, in the state, there's not you, there's no license to sell tobacco. In Genesee County, we've been more strict about our sort of guidelines, and they have to comply with your office. Yes, right. in Genesee County, they um, so the state of Michigan, like anybody can sell tobacco. Um, there is like a kind of like a tobacco license, um, but it's more for tax purposes. Got they it. Um, have to get their tobacco products from a wholesaler who pays taxes. Otherwise, if they don't get it from a wholesaler that pays taxes, they have to have a state of Michigan license, which it's only for tax purposes. But in Genesee County, the license that they pay for through us is actually giving them the authority to sell the tobacco products in our county. Otherwise, um, we can go in and take their tobacco products until they do pay us to get that license. And I'm um, sorry, this is kind of off that, but um, I forgot to mention before, we also um, work with like the smoke-free air law. Um, so if you ever went smoking in restaurants, um, smoking in different retailer stores and smoking in um, like manager offices of apartment complex, um, we also take those complaints. And if it's inside a restaurant, we pass that on to our EH division, um, the food sanitarians that deal with that restaurant in that area. Um, but if it's a non-restaurant, um, we do report that to the state of Michigan and keep that on file for us as well. And um, another thing is I, when, when Ellie and I were out um, updating the, the list of vendors, um, a couple of places I went into, there were uh, customers in there who were smoking cigarettes. And so the, um, the cashier was like, I, I'm, I, can't, I can't say anything because I'm afraid. You know, there's a safety issue too that goes along with that. They're hesitant to say anything to them about, you're not supposed to smoke in here. Please don't do that because people get ugly, you know, in this out there. And so they, so we have to be mindful of that too. I mean, we just post the signs up and everything, but I mean, you just can't make people enforce something when their safety is at risk too. So that's really, really helpful. Do you, have, what, for context, like how much is this fine? The fine's 200, I think it's, it's a fine. $200. $200 the first time. Um, and then it goes up every time. And after um, three times, we can take them in front of our board of health and um, lose their license to sell tobacco in Genesee County. So we can take their, their tobacco product products. Yeah. Um, and then, and eventually I believe um, we can also um, put their, um, I can't think of the word, sorry, their alcohol license at risk. So they could, um, as well as not sell tobacco, they could lose their alcohol license as well. 
Um, and there is some stores in Genesee County who um, lost their alcohol license and then they eventually just had to shut down because um, that's a big profit um, from the alcohol and tobacco sales. Well, I want to I want to thank you because it sounds like a big portion of what we do in terms of prevention happens through the work you're doing with compliance and holding these retailers accountable and being really thoughtful about how we make sure minors don't have access to 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 substances that they shouldn't have access to. So, super thank you to all the work that you do. Any last thoughts around tobacco suspension? cessation that you want to leave people with and that can be Lisa it can be Tate it can be Dr. Brittany uh any last thoughts that we should leave our our good community members with well I'm always going to put a pitch out here for the GCPC so we we have um our coalition effort is a collaboration of community partners and we have work groups that meet monthly um, to address these issues specific to marijuana and vaping. And so if you, anyone is interested in joining or continuing the conversation and looking at ways to be part of the solution, um, please join us. Um, I'll put my email in the chat so I can uh, follow up with you and invite you to the, the work group meeting that occurs on the fourth Tuesday of the month. Thank you so much. Super appreciate all of your expertise. This leads us into a really, really great conversation. We've talked about vaping. We've talked about tobacco sensation. Carrie Shanter is going to talk to us a little bit about uh, resources that we are going to have in the community uh, to support opiate use disorder and, and how we can respond to that. So Carrie, thank you so much for giving us a few minutes of your time. No problem. Um, I just want to say thanks for inviting me. This just happened yesterday afternoon at our MTA station downtown Flint. Um, for those of you who don't know, I work for Genesee Health System, but we have an FQHC, um, which is called Genesee Community Health Center, and they were able to receive a grant from the state um, that uh, supported this. And with a multi-partner project that we've been working on a few months now, uh, we were able to pull about five or six partners together in our community, which is our health center, MTA, U of M Flint Public Safety, U of M Flint Physician Assistant Program, our quick response team in Genesee County, and the Greater Flint Health Coalition. We were able to install um, our first Narcan and fentanyl testing strip vending machine uh, in a public high traffic place. So we're really pumped about it. A lot of other communities in Michigan have already done this and had a lot of success. So it was really time for our county to do something like this. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen if I'm allowed to. I wanna show you a picture of it. I it love that, yes, please. Yeah, I want you to be able to see what it looks like. It's not, I just kind of pulled it off the, um, one of the articles that was written. Let's see here if I can figure this out. Okay, hopefully you'll be able to see that machine. There's a little glare on it, yeah. but it's okay. Cool. Well, I uh, I'm pretty proud of it because it just looks like a candy bar machine or a pot machine, and all I got to just push the button. Um, it is free, and obviously no ID or anything's you know needed. It's it's open anytime the MTA station is open. So just in our one day yesterday, we went through a hundred boxes of naloxone or Narcan, the nasal spray, and almost as many fentanyl testing strips. So we had a press conference yesterday at two o'clock in the afternoon, you know, explained what, what the need is. Um, just so that this group knows, my guess is that many of you already know, but um, you know, we, we have a massive opioid crisis still on our hands. And if anything, it's gotten worse since the pandemic. Um, in 2020, we lost about 2,700 people from Michigan to an opioid overdose, but we know that it's significantly increased since the pandemic. And in 2021, 153 of those we're from our county alone. Um, so, you know, fighting the opioid crisis is not a one and done type of thing. Like there's multifaceted approaches, right? So one of them is harm reduction and a common harm reduction technique that's used in communities is naloxone um, being out in the community as well as fentanyl testing strips. So um, this is just one facet. We have a community-wide strategy, but this is just really one of them. Uh, so we're excited to be able to have that in a high traffic area. Really great coverage in our community yesterday. Couldn't believe how many like um, media outlets were really interested in this. So one of the, um, I got a couple minutes left, but one of the things I did want to share um, is one of the 
the stats that are it's really so profound that Genesee County has more than quintuple quintuple since 2000. So in the last 23 years, we've quintupled our um, drug induced death rate, and that's that's a really big deal. Uh, and we we continue to be higher than the Michigan rate and the United States uh, death rate as well. So we we need to address this. Um, I guess, um, are there any questions I can answer in the last uh, couple of minutes? We're hoping, this is kind of like a pilot. We're hoping that it goes really well. We have no reason to believe that it won't um, based on what the other communities are uh, experiencing. So I'd love to answer any kind of questions that somebody might have. Well, I would just love for you to put your info in the chat so that people can reach out to you with those questions. And I sure. definitely want to bring you back to talk more about this. And we talk about this on the webinar a fair amount, but we want to talk about, you know, we'd love to bring you back to talk about training on how to use it, right? Like how people, you know, once they get that packet, what do they do with it? So definitely appreciate okay. you putting your stuff in the chat and we will get back to you and we'll probably ask you to come back again and talk to people about, you know, We'd love to just be on site and just have you open up one and show us what to do. So. I would be so happy to do that. You know, there are specific instructions in each of the packets and we also have Spanish speaking as well. So happy, um, I'm happy to come back and I'm putting my stuff in right now. Thank you so running much. Close. Okay, there we go. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of our panelists today for being so uh, willing to share with us. Thank you so much. We can't wait to see you next week. Again, your CUs for community health workers. Thank you to Brit Dr. Brittany. Thank you to Carrie. Thank you to Lisa. Thank you to the health department. We will see you next week.